What's going on everybody? It's your boy Shogi from Shook Earth Media and today we are back again with House of the Dragon episode 2. This is the Game of Thrones spinoff. We got the first episode last week and made a big explosive episode. There was a lot of action in the last episode and we got to introduce all the characters. We learned a lot about the setting. They set the scene for everything and uh, as is per usual with TV shows, the second episode is where we get to see a lot more of what the show is going to actually be like on a regular basis so whereas the first episode is always just trying to do everything it can to push the best parts of the show to the audience you don't really know what the show is going to be like based on the first episode but based on this episode i think we can make some conclusions so overall it's a good episode solid plot some good drama here i particularly like a lot of the you know more quiet talking scenes there's a lot of finer detail in there and some decent dialogue and some interesting drama so it, there's no like big events in this episode but uh there are you know a bunch of little moments that add up to uh in in enhancing this family conflict we got going on which i i love to see so let me know what you guys think in the comment section down below and hit me with the like if you like and sub for more content like this i do movie and tv show reviews so if you like this show definitely keep it locked on shook earth media but let's just jump right into the episode. So we get the the actual theme song for this show this week. We didn't get it last week. And here we get a little uh, intro scene here. And it, we're animating blood. Blood is running. You know, that represents the, the book it's based on was called Fire and Blood. And obviously that represents uh, the, the family drama going on, the lineage etc of the targaryens and the valerius and whatnot so uh I, I like the concept it's a simple concept i will say they use the exact same song as game of thrones which i thought was a little odd honestly i i was hoping for something a little different i get basing it on the original theme song you know that most shows will do that they'll take uh the the basic notes and mix it up a little bit but this time, it, it, it sounds like the exact same track to me. I don't know if uh, maybe people more musically inclined might notice some more differences. But it sounded exactly the same to me. I can't recall a spinoff show ever doing that, where they use the exact same song as the original. Definitely correct me if, there, if you can think of another time that has happened. I can't think of a single time. <laughs> so it's a little odd to me. And uh, I get for the marketing reasons, they want to go with the member berries. They want to go with nostalgia. So... They don't want to try something new. I will say, I, I wish there was a bit more to the intro scene. Because, like, I love how the original one, we got all the different locations on the continent and stuff like that. So, we don't get anything like that here. But the first scene of the episode, we follow up with, uh, it was kind of like a throwaway conversation in the first episode. In the first council meeting, where we're following the princess into the council meeting. And they're talking about somebody taking over the seas uh, somebody from the free cities basically get, being very powerful and they are making shows of violence and they're called the crab feeders and now we know why we see the the crabs eating away at their victims on the beach i love this scene <laughs> it's brutal disturbing you love to see it dude and uh, in the wide shot of everything very cool uh, but this is just a teaser for what we're going to get, I'm assuming. We don't even see the crab feeder guy. We don't even uh, see anything like that. We just see a little bit of the aftermath. And this is just to bring it home for viewers who might have missed it the first time. And just to show how important this is going to be to the storyline going forward. So here we get, it's six months later now. After naming uh, the, the princess the new heir, now we are six months later. We've progressed things a little bit, but they're still talking about the same thing. Uh, they're still talking about going to war with the with the guy, the crab feeder man. And uh, the king is not about going to war with the free cities. But of course, uh, people are viewing the, the crown as vulnerable at this moment because the queen just died. The, you know, there's a new heir. There's all this stuff going on. So... Um, you know, I, I like this background conflict and the pressure of everything. I like the the fact that the whole world is is important, <laughs> and it's not just what's going on in King's Landing that matters. So 
I, I like that we're getting a little bit of the outside world in these scenes, and I like how it all plays off. And then the princess asserts herself in this scene. She wants to take her dragons to uh, the, 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 the crab feeder man, basically. Um, and basically, it's, too, it's too, too much, and it's too soon. Uh, she's not really in the place to be making statements like that, at least not one that people disagree with. <laughs> they give the, the new heir, the princess, something to do because uh, she's not doing her job well as in, uh, as a cupbearer, you're not supposed to have an opinion on anything. <laughs> so they decide to give her something to do. And here we have... Uh, men trying out to be a new member of the king's guard the princess finds out that only one of them has actual combat experience and she's very excited to see him and she's like leaning over the barrier and uh, uh, part of me likes this directing part of me doesn't because the part of me that does like it is because it, 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 she's breaking tradition here you can't really see her on the screen but the, her her pose right here is not like a princessly pose they would not teach you to stand like this, you know, because everything when it comes to royalty, hyper analyzed, your posture is very important. The way you present yourself is very important. So I, part of me likes this because she's interested enough that she's leaning forward. But part of me doesn't like it because I don't know that we've established uh, to the audience that this is significant. Uh, you know, maybe if the hand of the king is like, you know, stand up straight or something, but I, I don't know. Maybe he feels like he doesn't have the right to say that at this point, but yeah. So I, I, I like the directing ultimately. And, uh, I like that, uh, you know, she, she makes her decision basically on logic that makes sense at first glance. Um, she's like, we want somebody with combat experience to defend the king. The, uh, hand says that we should think about the political influences here. Uh, because he says other members of the King's Guard are from families that are important to the crown. Having them as a member of the King's Guard would strengthen the bond and it strengthens the kingdom. She's not interested in that. She has her own logic for doing what she does. And I think it's going to, uh, you know, when, when she, I, I feel like she's going to take over the crown. I'm almost sure about it. <laughs> but who, who knows, right? But I, I, that's what I think is going to happen. And uh, I, I think it's going to be interesting to track that over time, how that changes. Now, here we got uh, the princess's friend, the daughter of the Hand of the King. And last week in the first episode, we had uh, her father tell her to comfort the king. And I said in my review, I was like, I don't know what the point of the scene is. And now it is blatantly obvious what the point of the scene is. Basically, the Hand of the King was playing the long game and he was hoping that his daughter based on their interactions here, would get picked to be the next queen. And that's exactly what happens in this episode. And uh, it's a bit heavy-handed in the sense that it wasn't a surprise at the end of the episode because of how, how much they telegraph it with this scene. It, like, it, it was to a point where if the opposite happened, it wouldn't have made, th these scenes wouldn't have made any sense anymore. <laughs> you know, so I, that it, it did give away a little bit of the hand, but I like to see... Uh, I like to see the bond here, and it and it tracks. It all makes sense, uh, and, and I, I like their bond, ultimately. So I think they did a good job at establishing that. And now here they got a really great... I, I love this scene, and this is a, a another one of those things where... You, you'll see I like the subtle scenes more <laughs> if you watch a lot of my reviews, but I really like a lot of the drama we got going here because, you know, uh, on the surface, basically, the princess's friend is trying to broker the relationship between a uh, father and daughter um, and she tried in the last scene to get her father to approach the princess about the mother's death and he basically based off of what he said she was like okay that's not gonna work so she tries to come at it the other way and tries to convince uh, her friend the princess here that uh, she should do that she should approach her father about that and she's successful by basically leading her in a prayer with the candles. And uh, I was a bit surprised because last week we got uh, the princess doing something kind of sacrilegious in a way. She ripped up a religious text 
So um, when when um, Alistair, I'm sorry, I forget people's names, but when the princess's friend, the new queen to be, uh, when she says that uh, it, it might be silly, but I use this to talk to my mother. And uh, I, uh, to me, it was a bit surprising when uh, the princess said that it wasn't silly. Maybe because she's connected with death now in a more uh, front of mind way. Maybe now she understands. Maybe now like that's supposed to be a change in her or she went from not caring about the sept or any of that to now a gateway is open now. Now that matters to her. And she uh, has an emotional mo a moment where she uh, is, is praying and thinking about her mom and stuff. So, And you, you see that they have a close-up on, on their hands touching and stuff. And this is directing stuff that I, as of last week I was like, I think they're going for a romance here. And maybe, maybe, but after this episode I'm not so sure. But uh, it, they definitely want you to care about the connection between them. And I think they did a great job with that. So when it, at the end, when the, the queen to be is revealed, we get to have the princess feel betrayed because, you know, she specifically didn't tell her best friend about that, about the connection with the father. And in fact, the father said, don't tell, <laughs> don't tell my daughter. So again, these scenes, really, really good stuff, you know, and I like it. And here's another good one. We got a lot of great scenes back to back here. And we got Corliss. This character, I think, is going to be really interesting. I, I'm excited to see where his character goes from here. But uh, he proposes his daughter to be married to the king. Of course, he has always had that ambition. When his wife was not uh, made the queen, I'm sure that was very upsetting. And ever since then, he's wanted to do everything he can to make sure that his fa daughters or family can ascend to that. I think that's been his goal all along. Um, so, you know, he at, at first he coaches this as an apology and then proposes the marriage thing, which to me is like a big step because he was kind of disrespectful earlier, but he, he is so he's so important to the society and he's so uh, self-important. He's got the ego going that he's willing to he's willing to do this and and she is just as just as egotistical even more so i would say at least it seems like based on some of her conversations with uh the with the princess we'll get to in a bit and here we got another scene where the king is being treated for some ailment in the last episode six months ago it was something on his back uh we don't know the status of that if that is healed or not but now he's got a pinky finger that is rotting and usually in film literature etc ailments physical ailments injuries like that are symbolic of something so i i don't know if the pinky finger represents like a promise like a pinky promise that he made or or maybe the fracturing of his family the fact that his brother is at odds with him i'm not sure what it represents but i find it curious but it's reinforcing the fact i don't think the king is going to be around too much longer given uh, all the physical ailments he has and uh, the, the way we're talking about nothing but the, the lineage and remarriage and all of that. Uh, I think that everybody thinks he's going to die soon, but nobody's saying it. So uh, I like that. And uh, his council members advise him to pretty much take, take the, the daughter's hand in marriage, but he's not really about it. And we see why in the next scene, because she's like 12. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, it's, it, it, it's a weird feeling, but you got to remember in the proper context, these are the middle ages and 13 was pretty much an adult in the middle ages. In fact, in the original game of Thrones book, the first book, Danny is 13, 12 or 13 in that first, in the first book. And uh, of course she marries, uh, you know, Carl, Carl Drogo and all that. So, um, you know, she's older in the show, but, uh, in, in the book, she was, she was this, the age of this girl right now. So, uh, in the middle ages, things like this were probably considered normal as of in our current mindset. It's like, oh, dude, this it, 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 is it, EDP, young EDP over here <laughs> that the, the, at their wedding is going to be served cupcakes, dude. <laughs> Definitely, uh, hit me up in the comments if you get the reference, but <laughs> 
then we get a scene where the princess was watching that conversation take place and the queen to be pretty much like she's actively trying to antagonize her um she's presenting it as if she's saying helpful things but i i think it's the jealousy I, she never got over not being the queen so she wants to rub it in a little bit and she's basically telling the princess like yeah the men the men are going to take the the throne from you because they'd rather light the kingdom than 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 have a woman take the throne you know, I don't know. In today's day, uh, uh, 10 years ago, I might have heard a line like that and not really thought about it too much. But <laughs> it's just a cliche at where we're at right now. It's kind of lame, but uh, I get what they're going for, you know. And I don't think they did a great job establishing in the last episode that it was like a rule that nobody, no woman had ever been queen or anything. I, I don't know. I didn't really get all that I was supposed to, I think. Here we are back with the king and the queen to be might as well just say that and I, I like that there's a little touch in the first scene that they had together uh he broke a dragon and then she comes back and heals it basically and she gets the stonemasons to fix it and that's the gift and uh the the dragon breaking i think symbolizes the targaryen household in pieces and her bringing it to him back together again it, obviously that represents her being the healing that the family needs or maybe that's what she wants it to be i i don't think that her being married is going to heal the family as we'll get to later um but yeah i i like that I, these little things these little details are what i like the most you know um so here in this in this scene we got a emergency meeting of the small council and now uh matt smith's character the brother of the king has stolen a dragon egg and uh, apparently the he has a bunch of the gold cloaks that we saw in the first episode with the massacre a lot of them went to dragonstone with him and uh there's basically this civil war brewing basically so he still presents himself as the rightful heir you know we find out that it was the same the same dragon's egg that was given to uh, the 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 young heir who only lasted a few minutes, <laughs> right? So uh, I I like all the symbolism there. He's clearly trying to provoke his brother. We'll get it. I have some theories about Matt Smith's character, but we'll get back to that in a second. Um, I I like this scene here. Uh, I like to establish that she's pretty much um, the queen to be is pretty much doing her father's bidding by going to visit the king and it, based on this scene it seems like she's uncomfortable with it i think this scene establishes that she's aware of how the princess is going to take it when she gets the news at the end <laughs> i think she's worried in this scene so I, again the subtle directing there's good stuff in here I'm, I'm telling you guys some good stuff going on and here we are at Dragonstone, and we have kind of a, a standoff on the Great Wall of China looking thing. <laughs> so uh, I, I like the setting. I will say, uh, I seem to recall, and I even pulled up a map over here, but I seem to recall in previous seasons of the show that um, it takes a while to get from place to place. So here's King's Landing. And here's Dragonstone. I guess it's not that far. You take it by boat. But I, I think it takes long. Like, think of how far away, like, High Garden was. It took a long time to get there. That's maybe twice as far. I don't know if you can get there and back in a day, can you? I don't know. Like, in the last season of the show, it seemed like they gained teleport. Of the original show, rather. They seemed to gain, like, teleporting abilities. And all of a sudden, they didn't have to worry about how long it took them to get from place to place. And there's, like, traveling, time traveling practically everywhere. So, uh, I think we lost a little bit of the scope, you know, with, with stuff like that. So, I don't know. But it, it seems a little too far to get there back in the day. But that's, it's a nitpick, but I, I think it's important. But anyways, uh, I, I like the confrontation here. And pretty much Matt Smith's character, he's there. 
Uh, he he just wanted to get his brother out here. That's why he sold the egg. That's all everything. And my theory is that he just wants his brother's respect. <laughs> I don't know that he really cares about the throne so much. I think he cares about how his brother views him. And he doesn't want to be the outcast of the family anymore. So that's my theory on this guy. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. Remember, I, I don't know the lore of this. I haven't read Fire and Blood. I only read the first Game of Thrones book. So I, I'm the only basing this on the show itself. <laughs> you guys will have to let me know. But I like how the Hand of the King is completely butchering this <laughs> like he's just insulting the guy calling his wife a, or his soon-to-be new wife a whore and all that and uh it turns out that he didn't even tell uh his supposed soon-to-be wife about that this is her here we saw her we saw them together in the first episode remember when he couldn't uh blow his load <laughs> he couldn't finish seal the deal you know what i mean he couldn't do it <laughs> but uh he, it turns out he, he's only said that to provoke his brother and to get his brother out here. Now, I wonder what he would have done if his brother did come out here, but I suspect it would not end in conflict. I think he just wanted to... Uh, I think he just wanted to talk to him. <laughs> so, but he's provoking a conflict here. He pulls out his sword. He's like basically a come and take it type of thing. He holds the egg out, like, come, come take it from me, which is, you know code for i will attack you if you try to take it <laughs> and then out of the blue we get uh we get the princess flying in on the dragon so part of me likes this part of me doesn't okay part of the part of me that doesn't is thinking okay so the dragon can go faster than than an army <laughs> i'm like the timing of it okay she didn't leave at the exact same time she waited how did she know when they were going to have the, like, she, she arrived right on time, <laughs> you know? So it, it's a coincidence thing kind of bothers me, unless she was just like, happened to be waiting nearby for the right moment to appear. But if that was, the, I, I don't know, I guess maybe she would be able to hear what they're saying because it, it would echo or something. But <laughs> So that, that's a nitpick thing. But uh, earlier in the episode, when the king was talking to the, the young girl, she was talking about a dragon that was missing. And it turned out that uh, he has the other dragon as well. So she basically says like, oh, if you want to, if you want to, I'm the one you're mad at because I'm the one who's the rightful heir. You can kill me right now. Um, which, first of all, I don't think, <laughs> I don't think that uh, the hand of the king and the rest of them would be okay with letting her pass through. You know, I think they would, they would not allow that to happen. One. Two. <laughs> It's a it's very reckless of her to do that, but I guess she feels very she's got that youthful confidence, and they had that bond that we established in the last episode. Her and her uncle had the bond, so uh, I guess she feels pretty uh, significant that you know she's not going to get killed here. But I wouldn't be so sure. <laughs> but uh, based on this, you know he 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 does turn around and leave. He gives her the egg, so it ultimately works because. I don't think being the heir is the issue. I, 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 like I said, I think it's the issue of respect. That's what he wants. It's cool to be back on this set again, Dragonstone. And that's when it like kicked in. Like, oh yeah, <laughs> I know Dragonstone. Um, so yeah, and then we get, this is the scene where she's like, I uh, didn't, she didn't know about, uh, you know, supposedly not only are they going to be married, but she's also pregnant which uh, apparently she can't even get pregnant. <laughs> she got her tubes tied or whatever the medieval equivalent is. And uh, yeah, so, so she's talking about how um, she is with him because she wants to be safe. And she feels that uh, he put her in danger with this. And uh, I, like, I like the conflict there, you know, and I, I like having a little bit extra complexity there and uh, giving her a will of her own is, is, is cool from a writing standpoint, so I like it. And now we get a scene where the king is meeting with this this guy who, who I don't remember, but he's on the council, and he advises uh, the king to take the uh, Corliss's daughter in marriage. He says you should marry the girl because it'll strengthen the kingdom and all that. He, he, bas he, he says, yes, you should. That is his opinion. And, of course, we know that he's not going to do that. <laughs> I like this scene, too. But 
part of me is like, I, maybe it's supposed to show the king's weakness, but it felt like, you know, he, he she comes into the room, he's angry, and she asks to sit down, which is not something you ever do with a king. Again, like, people who don't know about medieval history or anything wouldn't know this, but um, you don't, you, you you get asked to sit. You don't, you do not even pose that. <laughs> So it's stepping on the king's toes and he, he just like kind of lets her walk over him, which I don't like. I, I feel like uh, maybe that's the point is, again, to show his weakness. But um, yeah, it's not king-like behavior, I would say. So, uh, but, uh, you know, ultimately I do like the bond here and, uh, you know, the, the final acceptance that, yes, the king has to remarry. She basically gives her blessing. And then uh, here he's thinking about it. And again, we got this window again, and of course, I, I referenced it last episode, I'm thinking about the the king that committed suicide out the window at the uh, the one of the last few seasons of the original show. I, I think it's on purpose. I think that he's, he's about to do a, a kind of suicidal act in the final scene of this episode, so I think that's what we're referencing here. Um, although it's a different window. But I still think of that. So it's kind of hard not to. <laughs> but yeah, and then we're in this uh, conference room and he's announcing his decision. Uh, of course, I, I, I would think it would be, it would stand out that she's here. So one thing that doesn't really work with the scene is, so this is the new the new queen, right? He wants to marry her because of the, the comfort that she gave to him. Um, but I, I would think that her presence there, the fact that she's not normally there, would have tipped off the princess previously to what was going on. But she takes it as a surprise. That's one note. I will say I do love the subtlety of the direction here. Like, she's afraid to meet eye contact with her best friend because she knows that her best friend's going to view it as a betrayal. And, you know, I, I like the, 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 the performances here are really good. This one shot gets a lot of information across, you know, her feeling about it. She's supporting her father here. And then she finds out who the queen is going to be. And then she feels betrayed. And you, you see all this, the transitions and the subtlety there. The transitions as an actor and a director, that's one of the hardest things to nail down uh, when it comes to characters and acting and stuff. So I uh, just wanted to give my thumbs up to that. So I like uh, this guy. He's upset uh, about, you know, the proposal not being uh, accepted. I think he's surprised. Um, all these reactions are expected. I kind of wanted him to do something a little unexpected. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Maybe he would have pretended to be okay with it and then done his, you know, conniving behind the scenes. But uh, yeah, he basically goes directly to where the camera shot is like, who is he talking to? Who is he talking to? And uh, he, he's talking about how his, his father was a king and he uh, basically had to fight to be the leader and he took those desires with him to King's Landing. And we pan over and it's Matt Smith. And now to me, that was like, I, I knew he was talking to him, so I didn't find it surprising. I, I, I was like, the only other person it could have been is this uh, crab feeder guy he's been talking so much about. And that would be interesting if, like, he knew so much about this crab feeder guy because he was talking to him behind the scenes. Uh, but we don't know what that guy looks like, so revealing him in this way wouldn't mean anything. The, like, the whole... The, I, I get It's a good shot still, but the whole, like, revealing Matt Smith at the last second thing... To me, it kind of falls flat because there's like nobody else it could have been. <laughs> Let me know what you guys think. But he's worried about the realm and losing the the sea. So he wants to go up against the crab feeder guy. And he thinks that uh, the former heir is the one to do that. So that's where we leave with this episode. Uh, I do like the, su the subtle touch that uh, he gets to say what he wants about his brother, but he does not accept that from Corliss here. So um, I, I would say that, like like I've been saying, I don't think it's the, the throne that really interests him. I don't, it's not violence, it's not sex, it's his brother's respect more than anything. It is what I think at this moment. That's my theory. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section down below. It's been your boy Shuggy. Thanks for watching, everybody. 
Peace out.